Moving along, the tag race from the first game involved riding on a special gear that would have been able to lock to the extreme gear of your partner. Only it seems that there is no punishment when you get too far from your partner in free riders, but I could be wrong there. It appears to be more or less the same as the previous game, but it does seem to be a lot easier to confuse the game into thinking there is a second player than the previous game, where all it required was a second controller. Confusing the game was how I was even able to get any multiplayer footage in the first place. Confusing the game was how I was even able to get the multiplayer footage that you see right now in the first place. You can do it for tag race mode as well, but I wouldn't recommend either on your own unless you want to struggle through all of the courses there for the sake of achievements of just beating them. Never said first place after all, just beating them. Speaking of achievements, this game includes achievements from the Xbox 360. Many of the achievements are the basic completion ones, such as completing the tutorial mode and story mode, but the more interesting ones are the ones involving time attack mode, with each course receiving its own achievement. I will give them credit that they actually gave me a reason to do time attack mode for this game, better than the arbitrary achievements that just seem to be there to add replay value, though to be fair a lot of games have arbitrary achievements. I also noticed that there was some kind of weird glitch with the replay mode, where the playback tends to quit just a few seconds before it was supposed to finish. Heck, the replay feature at one point got confused and thought I was in last place! Take a look at the proper run and the actual replay! In fact, this game seems to be slightly glitchier than the previous two entries, although the glitches are more technical than anything else. For example, while the game does look nice, running at a smooth frame rate, there is this weird effect on the rings where the rings appear to be cut in half for a moment. At the end of the day, these issues are pretty minor, but I still don't understand how the replay feature tends to end a bit earlier than usual, especially since the previous two games always had it just fine. On to the other modes, there is the free race mode similar to the normal race mode of the previous entries, so not much there. Besides the standard normal race, there are two other modes. Ring collection and damage survival, as you've seen beforehand in story mode. Make note that both of these modes require you to use each of the characters' default gear. I guess it's so that there aren't any cheaters using a special type of gear. Ring collection is to collect more rings than your opponents before the time runs out, while damage survival is using items to attack your opponents to earn the most points. Taking damage in ring collection will make you lose rings, obviously, while taking damage in damage survival will deplete your special air meter. You might have noticed this meter with the target torpedo missions with E10,000B. The special air meters don't deplete in the normal fashion. Instead, you lose air taking damage from the attacks of others, or from running into these electrified obstacles. What I find odd is that if you lose all of your health while in first place, and not the amount of time running out, the game says that you already won. Wouldn't it make more sense to be disqualified in this case than win? That's just weird. I might as well mention that the Octoink power-up now spews bombs instead of ink, and that the icons of the air item boxes are now hearts. The former makes sense, but I guess they changed the latter for this case to appear more appropriately like health. A nice, albeit somewhat unnecessary if you ask me, attention to detail. It should also be mentioned that the golf and basketball power-up aren't available in these modes at all, which would make sense, as otherwise these modes would be too easy, to say the least. What they both have in common is that in normal races, they target the character in first place, and can only be avoided by performing tricks, using the grind or flight type skill, are riding a special mode of transportation in the stage if it has one, or are using the fortress gear that makes you invincible. The only difference is that the power-ups are exclusive to certain gear, with the golf one exclusive to boards and the basketball one exclusive to bikes, respectively. 
As for the visuals themselves, I really don't have much to say on them besides that I find them to be bright and colorful, with a good amount of detail. I'd say that Freeriders is above average when it comes to all of its stages. Though I can't really say as much for visual variety. Compared to the previous entries, there are about half as less of unique looking stages. Unless you have been keeping a very close eye on the track designs, you may have noticed that there doesn't seem to be that many stage designs. Well, technically there are more, but that is because each stage has an expert and standard variant. This is just a guess, but I would say standard is normal difficulty, while expert is harder difficulty. But I wouldn't know that because both variants across all stages feel the same. You see in the previous entries, while each stage would be a variant on each other, each stage did feel unique with a combination of both different visual and track designs. Not just track designs! With the visual designs, they made sure that the stage would look familiar to its counterpart yet feel different. With the track designs, while they would at times use similar layouts, that doesn't mean that they are copy and paste. Each stage would have their own distinct track designs that alongside distinct visual designs would help each and every one to feel distinct. Not to say that Freeriders doesn't try anything, it still does at least have altered layouts to distinguish one version of the stage from the other, but I feel that they could have done more here. Heh, <laughs> how many times are you going to hear that from me in this review? I don't mind reusing assets in video games, as long as the assets being reused are organized in such a manner that they feel different from each other. For example, comparing Central City and Westopolis from Shadow the Hedgehog, both have destroyed city-based landscapes, but how the assets are organized alongside different music and missions make these two stages feel different from each other. Observe. Let's take this one step further with Sonic Heroes. An often common complaint of Sonic Heroes is that the campaigns feel too similar to each other in terms of the level layouts that you go through for each of the four teams. I'd say yes and no to that. Technically, yes. Each team is going through the same basic layouts, but the developers worked on top of those layouts to make the most out of the assets with each of the teams. Team Sonic's levels are of normal difficulty, Team Dark's are of hard difficulty, Team Rose's are easy difficulty, and Team Chaotix is a different story. With each team, the layouts were given tweaks in of themselves, with some teams finding themselves in unique locations others can't get to. The most noticeable differences about these layouts by far are the enemies, where no team is ever dealing with the same set of enemies, which is something I appreciate in a combat-heavy game. Team Chaotix is the only team that most critics will note as different due to that their objectives aren't always getting to the end of a stage. Some missions consist of finding a certain amount of certain items, some require you not to be detected by enemies, and some even require you to eliminate certain items. Yes, eliminate fire! Yes! They are often noted as being the most unique team in Heroes as a result of this. While I would agree that they do feel the most unique, that's not to say that the others didn't feel different as well. Alongside the level design tweaks is the different campaigns and voiceovers from all the different characters. While one could argue that the story is just there for context and that the continual chatter is nothing more than flavor text, I fail to see that being necessarily a bad thing. The cutscenes themselves offer unique feedback for the player, as well as the flavor text preventing the feeling of sameness. That's not to say that this couldn't have been improved, such as the game always feeding the player suggestions on which formation to tackle enemies, when it can be argued that these suggestions aren't needed for most of the time. Still, the altered level layouts, banter from different characters, and different campaigns make the most out of the older and less capable hardware. If you want a game that came out around the time of Heroes, that's actually as repetitive as many claim Heroes to be, try the 2003 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles video game based on the 2003 animated series of the same name. 
Trust me, the repetition is real there! Now where was I? Oh right! The point I'm getting at is that free riders could have done more here. Maybe have three more stage variants, adding up to four total stages for each team. Of course, this would extend to each new environment. They can even separate them by difficulties again, with easy, normal, hard, and very hard respectively. For all I care, they could be thrown on any team. The hero's example was just that, an example. Ooh! Or better yet, give them different themes based on the original theme for each new variant. For example, tropical styled dolphin resort could become frozen and have a tropical freeze theme. I'm not ripping anything off. Ooh, or that frozen forest can suddenly have magma. Is that the right word, magma? Right. Can become a fire and ice based stage in one variant. I wouldn't even mind a bit of asset reuse, though for this game it would still require more unique assets to be included to disguise the simpler level design as to not seem so apparent. I can understand why the level design had to be simpler for this game, but that doesn't mean there couldn't have been more variety, even if it was just the level designs themselves. Of course, I would prefer more, but what can you do for a budget game, really? You can only do so much. Just to be clear, it is not the level design that I have an issue with. <coughs> just to be clear, it. Just to be clear. Just to be clear, it's not the level design that I have. Just to be clear, it's not the level design that I have an issue with. It's fine for the most part, if a bit on the unmemorable side. Well, that's not entirely true. I do remember this section where you have to do consecutive jumpy jumper jumperoos over and over to get to the end of a section, which just happens to cross right into the character type shortcuts. <laughs> I like that part because it acts as a harder alternative to the easier fly type that would normally access that area. And that it demands intense interaction. Or jumping from the other side, that is. <laughs> what makes it memorable is that there isn't another section in the game that demands this many jumps in a row. I really wished that they had more sections like this where for taking the harder and trickier paths, there would be obstacles and bottomless pits, for example, that would set you back if you failed to overcome these said obstacles. They could vary in either short jaunts, like the jumping example, or they could serve as an entirely new way to navigate these stages. Again, the two variants of each stage may have their own level designs to stand out, but the lack of extra stages and visual designs make this feel inexcusable for stopping here. Before you argue that the sameness is a matter of making sure that it fits in line with the story, let me counter-argue with this. With the previous entries, they never had an issue with having a decent variety of stages while justifying their existence alongside the story they were telling, even for being simple stories. With a few reworks of the script, I'm sure that the story of Free Riders could have justified more environments. Heck, even Sonic Heroes, which came out on lesser hardware and had its own issues during development, came out with a good amount of visual variety, even more so than Freeriders itself. With Sonic Freeriders, again, I don't know when its development started besides maybe being after Zero Gravity was published, but since it was an Xbox 360 exclusive, it could afford to do more, or at least be on par with previous entries. This is also not the first time the developers had worked on this kind of hardware, with at least two entries consisting of Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic Unleashed in previous years. Granted, I am aware that the Riders games were more so supplementary budget games to complement the bigger Sonic games that were coming out later in their respective years, but those two entries felt excusable for their budget while this one could have had more for it considering being made for one much more capable console. That's enough harping, I've made my point here. I think that I've kept you all waiting for long enough. You want to know what's up with the controls of Sonic Freeriders? 
Believe it or not, the culprit is none other than... SONIC THE HEDGEHOG HIMSELF! Well, not so much Sonic himself, but more so a mechanic that's based on something that was purely cosmetic in the previous entries. As stated before, the game is controlled by performing gestures in front of the Kinect. Starting with the menu controls, they are actually fine once you know what you're doing. Just follow an iconic scene from the Karate Kid, and just wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Let me show you the way. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. For the record, I didn't try the voice selecting feature where one would select from the menu by saying the names. Mostly because I'm not much of a names kind of guy, you know? I don't really memorize names that often. But anyway, the menu navigation might be a bit slower than the previous games, but it's still manageable. The real meat from the game stems from what happens before you start a race. What you see here is where all of the complaints of the game have originated from. Whether or not they were aware of this. More likely they weren't. The game doesn't provide it a name, so I'll call it the Neon Void. Just because. Neon Void, why not? In this mysterious void... In this mysterious void, the Kinect will measure your body movements... In this mysterious void... The Kinect will first... You then get into position, then you- In this mysterious void! The Kinect will first measure your body movements, where you then get into position, then you will start moving forward, with the game wanting you to follow Amochao while doing your best not to hit the cones. Depending on how far you're able to move in the left and right directions will be represented by this light blue bar. After a few moments, there will be a white fade-out, and the game will start. That's what goes on in general, but the thing about this game is that outside the body movement statement, there is nothing more explained about this section, which doesn't help that this is the most important part of the game! In a move that seems to be exclusive to this Kinect game, Sonic Freeriders opts for some kind of system that I can only imagine is measuring your height, length, and width in order to determine the optimal movement for gameplay. If I had to guess, it would be that this whole system was created so that it would be able to compensate for the various different body shapes and heights that would be playing this game. If so, while very considerate on the intentions, the decision to do that is what hurts the game the most. To illustrate what I'm saying here, let me talk a bit about my earliest experiences with the game. Truth be told, my initial impression of the game was a bit rough, just like many of the others, but nevertheless I kept moving forward. Things got a bit better when I discovered that the game had a whole on its hands. To pause the game itself, you either perform this weird 45 degree hand gesture thingy, where you hold your hands to the bottom left, or you could just do what I did and step out of view of the camera. That gesture with your arm I never understood for a while, despite it appearing frequently in the bottom left corner of the screen. I also have to thank the miracles that the game has a reset button at all! Otherwise, my time with it would have been less favorable than how it was already going at the moment. No one wants to play through a mission to get the highest rank when you know that you've already messed up earlier in said mission. Moving on, I also got a calibration card for my Kinect later into the Let's Play, because the Kinect I got didn't come with one for some reason. Though, I suppose the fact that the Kinect came with everything else, was in good condition, came with a few games, Freeriders. Ugh. 
Though I suppose, though I suppose, though I suppose the fact that the Kinect came with everything else was in good condition, came with a few games. Free Riders was actually a surprise freebie alongside the bundle. Costed fifteen dollars overall, and that Kinect calibration cards can cost less than a dollar. I wasn't too upset to say the least. After the calibration, it sort of felt better, I think anyway, but nothing major. That is, until this happened. I'm still angry about that yoink away from the pole, but aside from that though, the game had started to be something that surprised me. Fun. 
That's right. It was fun. As if out of nowhere, the controls were buttery smooth, responsive, and fluid. Or at least they felt that way anyway. It didn't instantly dawn on me why the controls felt perfect all of a sudden. But later on, I found myself preferring Goofy style to regular style. The weirdest thing about it was that Goofy style always felt better to use than regular style for some reason. For starters, I could turn without feeling like I needed to do my best Matrix impression. And secondly, I could jump without the game missing my inputs. It's really annoying. Nine times out of ten, Goofy style was preferable to regular style. Who's the one out of ten to prefer regular style to Goofy? Well, it might be the people who had some actual luck when it came to the regular style, which is possible because I encountered the scenario where the regular style was preferable. Though it was just once, maybe twice, it did happen. For the record, these smooth and buttery controls occurred just at one other time late into the Let's Play. Again with Jet the Hawk. Jet the Hawk, which in case someone didn't notice or cared to notice, has always been positioned in a goofy style for the previous two entries, and has always faced that direction in his subsequent appearances. Sonic the Hedgehog, on the other hand, has always faced regular style. Obviously, the game lets you switch between these two styles with all characters that can use boards. So Jet can be in the regular style and Sonic goofy as opposed to their usual respective styles. However, because Sonic has an almost certain chance of being the very first character you play as in this game, there is a very likely chance of people encountering a bad first impression because they would have been emulating Sonic's flawed style. Granted, the goofy style isn't perfect either. Because the system changes the sensitivity of your controls every time you start a new race, coupled with the fact that this is a Kinect game that requires constant movement, and you can have the odds stacked against you. The most common scenario that you'll be facing in this game is that even when most gestures work, there's at least one that will be finicky in its execution. And you have to spend about what feels like forever trying to figure out where the triggers are. It's not perfect by any means, but had Goofy Style been the style to give the first impression instead of regular, I believe that the reception would have been a bit warmer overall. I get the idea of what they were going for here, I really do. But the execution? Is just all over the place, and most of it isn't optimal. To put this situation another way, have any of you played a game where at one point it decided to switch up your controls? There was only one review that I could find, on Daily Motion no less, mentioning the controls being all over the place instead of just saying they're outright broken. Okay, well... Um, let's just say that the reviewer seemed to be a bit more aware of how the game's controls operated. You know, instead of just playing the game for a short while and giving up like many others did. Sonic fans at the very least are able to get through the basic story, and never play any more of it, but at least that's something. Imagine those who aren't fans reviewing this game. Regardless of how long one has played the game, it is impossible to get completely used to it because it keeps resetting the sensitivity of the control scheme. Making things worse is that because of this, the feedback from the game is unclear. It would seem that if you are either too far to the left or right, even by a few inches, mind you, you'll be spending several minutes just figuring out the best place to stand before your gestures will work as intended. In fact, that's the worst aspect about this game. Lack of feedback. It's one thing to come back to an old game and learn something new you never knew about before, but when you feel that you aren't learning after some time, you're very likely to get discouraged. This is especially the case with the regular style, as just like me, most people started with the regular style because Sonic, the first character people are likely to play as, faces to the right, not left. That's a reminder of the controls. 
By poor feedback, let me explain it away with the Xbox 360 version of Kung Fu Panda 2, controlled exclusively with the Kinect! Now, for the most part, the game is rather decent with its execution of the Kinect controls. Even if not perfect by any means, again, I was able to get used to most of the different gameplay styles on my own, with me getting true 100% in story, achievements, and all of the gold medals, which are tied to the achievements. However, there was one gameplay style that I've been having trouble with that I needed to look up help for, because I didn't know what I was doing wrong here. It's in regard to one particular type of segments. The noodle serving segments. Or if you want to be playful with the name, Diner Dash for Connect. The objective of these segments is for you to cook, prep, and then toss colorful bowls of noodles to hungry customers who want to eat delicious noodles. However, as you can tell from the footage, it's not as simple as just tossing any old bowl of delicious noodles to customers, but ones with specific colors. Each color represents a different flavor that the customer wants. If you give them what they want, they will be happy and you will get more points and time as a result. Toss them the wrong bowl and they'll still eat the noodles and you'll still get points, but you won't get as many. And you will lose time. That's important. In the challenges themselves, if you want the gold medal, you actually have to be giving the customers what they want consecutively. Otherwise, you will start right back at square one in regards to points. And such as the case with these segments, the better you do, the more treasure you will get. That Poe is implied to return to the citizens who lost their money from thieves! Yeah! Weird that they don't separate Poe's tips from the actual stolen treasure that's being found all over the place. But I guess Poe is just that generous! As for the game itself, treasure that you find throughout the game is only in service of the achievements. Nothing more than that, just so you know. Back to Diner Dash at hand, to complete these stages, you need to get enough Back to points Diner Dash to clear them, even which though means it is that a little you can't generous with how many points you need to advance the story. It is rather generous story. with the amount of points that enough, you need, but you don't, don't get too sloppy, otherwise you will need to start over. Worse yet, for some strange reason, the game doesn't pause when you step out of the way of the Kinect. Well, technically it does, but instead of an option to reset what you're doing, the game just gives you a message saying that it can't see you. If you fail a mission, you have to watch the cutscene that happens right before it yet again, yet still with no option to skip it. I really have to stop digressing like this, but hey, the more you know, right? Anyway, to reiterate, the objective of these Diner Dash segments is to get the delicious bowls of noodles that the customers want to them. You start by stretching out one of your arms to grab the corresponding colored bowl of the next customer you plan on giving noodles to. If you grab the wrong one, try and save face by tossing it to a different customer that wants that flavor of noodles. Next, you waggle your arms rapidly up and down for Poe to start prepping the noodles in the corresponding bowl that you've just grabbed. Last but not least is the part where you toss the noodles to the intended customer. Toss it correctly and the customer will get it. Toss it incorrectly and you will either give it to the wrong customer, or the perfectly good bowl of noodles will be smashed. A crying shame indeed. While you're prepping the noodles, you also have to be mindful of the customers. At any point during the lunch rush, the customers will change their minds on what bowl of noodles they're in the mood for. Even if you just happen to give them the flavor of noodles they were just asking for two seconds ago! Ungrateful little punks! Ungrateful little punks! Ungrateful little punks! A little less random is the customers leaving. If you take too long to get a customer's order out, they'll start to get bored. Take too much longer when they get to this point and they will leave, which is obviously something you don't want. The customers themselves come with two types, bunnies and pigs. Both operate the same, with the only difference being that pig customers will want two servings of noodles instead of just one, such as the bunnies. That's the only difference that I've noticed anyway. 
Oh, and one more thing. There will be times when the customer will toss their bowls right back at Poe, with you needing to perform this game's block maneuver to protect Poe so that he catches it, and that it doesn't smash against his face with you losing time as a result. I believe that this is exclusive to dissatisfied customers that received the wrong noodles, though I could be wrong in that regard. If I'm wrong, I'll have a message saying so right about now. Is it there? Well, regardless, let's continue, shall we? Now that you all know more about this segment than you would have cared for, you might be asking what the point of all of that was. The point, or should I say, problem, my friend, is the simple act of tossing a delicious bowl of noodles. You see, with how Poe here is holding the delicious bowl of noodles, combined with the icon demonstrating the ideal motion for tossing said delicious bowl of noodles, is by tossing them like a frisbee! Well, not exactly. I do appreciate that the game provides directions for what it wants the player to do, Sadly, it doesn't seem to represent the programming in a proper manner. If you actually try to throw in a frisbee motion, there's a very likely chance, and I do mean very likely chance, that the game will instead throw to another table, or seem to not even work in some cases. Though the latter might just be me too nervous to toss another bowl of noodles in general. Not the game not working, just me being too nervous. I kind of forgot. As a result of you throwing to the wrong table, what you want to do is something a bit more... straightforward, you might say. Finding help on an achievement-based website, one of the people said that in regards to doing an achievement related to this segment, it is much better to stretch out your arms in a set direction instead of where you want to toss your bowls in a frisbee motion. Don't be doing this too quickly after you've prepped the food, however. If you gesture too rapidly in the regards of a game not programmed to handle the fast inputs, it results in a missed input. In this case, you won't be tossing your delicious bowl of noodles. What I recommend is that once you've prepped your food, pull back on your arm close to your chest, and then lunge in either the upper left, up, or upper right directions. Don't be afraid to lean either a bit to the left or right when throwing to the left or right. A similar case can be when grabbing a particular bowl. For example, when grabbing a blue bowl, make sure that your arm is reaching out to the left while leaning forward, and vice versa with the red bowls. For the green bowls, just stretch your arm out as straight as possible. You will know what bowl Poe will be reaching for based on how he looks when reaching in the respective directions. If you follow what I'm saying, then you should be able to clear these Diner Dash segments with ease, and make it possible to get the gold medals. Because the gold medals are obviously going to be a lot harder. So, word of warning there. You might be wondering what Kung Fu Panda 2 for the Xbox 360 had to do with Sonic Freeriders there. Well, again, it was what I said before when I went into it. Feedback. For the most part, when it comes to Sonic Freeriders, most of the gestures are easily doable. Its biggest problem, again, stems from a combination of constant movement and, more importantly, constant sensitivity changes. The issue of constant movement isn't nearly as much of a problem for Kung Fu Panda 2, because it doesn't have the system Freeriders has. Not to say that never had any issues at all, but I found that it had overall less controller-based issues when compared to Freeriders. Though the lack of proper representation on the Diner Dash segments were a notable issue as I've just pointed out a few seconds ago. What do you think is worse? A game where it's constantly changing its sensitivity, or a game telling you the wrong instructions? Either way, both are pretty bad. Let me reiterate that the right style can work, but I'd rather have both styles working at once, not just one. 
It also goes without saying that this compromises the gear part switching mechanic to a severe degree, to the point that it is almost not even worth using it to take full advantage of what it could do. And just so you all know, the bike gear is also fine for the most part. Just don't try turning too severely. Otherwise, the game will think you are trying to brake on account that the brake function operates in a similar manner to boards. To brake with the boards, you turn to face the connect head on. Whereas with the bike gears, you turn to face the side just like the board gears. A uh, neat little vice versa thing going on there. On top of that is because of the slight input delay and loose controls, precision is almost impossible. Though at the very least, the game does do well enough in its level design to accommodate for this control scheme in various ways. For example, most of the grind rails are given long starts for the players to ease into to start grinding. There's also the aforementioned extra distance when punching with power type, how there are jump ramps specifically made for sharp turns to compensate for drifting, just to name a few. Though with punching in particular, I'd recommend a more defined punch as opposed to just, oh, I don't know, flailing your arms and hoping for the best. The game actually can register the art of arm flailing as a punch, but I wouldn't recommend it as believe me, it ain't too precise as it sounds. While on the subject of proper gestures, there are a few more that I can talk about, such as non-gear forms of transportation. For the minecarts, I'd recommend that you have one arm set out to your left, and one arm set out to your right like so. If you move either in your left or right hand, the character you're playing as will have the minecart turn in that direction when a junction point comes up. There's water skiing, in which all you need to do is pretend that you are riding an actual water ski as depicted in the game. Turning is simple enough by moving to the left and right directions, and I'd recommend that you take every trick ramp on these paths. Jumping is automatic here, so no need to worry about timing. If you do take every one of these trick ramps, you'll be thrown to a higher platform at the end of the segment which is generally better, at least if you can stay up there for long enough. The last mandatory one is with the Frozen Forest stage, on both variants, which I would argue is the most finicky of them all. It's not hard to understand the basics. You move to the left and right just like any other jet ski, but what I found hard to understand is just how sensitive the jet ski can get. Sometimes it's turning is super fast, other times it's not as sensitive. Interspersed in these sections are icy pillars that will slow you down for a few moments if you run into them, and are telegraphed by rows of rings that you will want to follow for guidance. And, you know, rings. Rings, rings. Really, that's the only segment in this game that could have done better in the controls department. Well, that's not entirely true. Another one that could have been a bit better is the optional one where you grab onto a train car and shimmy to the left and right. Grabbing and holding onto it, which yes, you have to keep holding onto it manually, is easy enough, but I think the game could have done a bit more with a more defined shimmying gesture. It isn't too hard to shimmy as is, but I feel this could have been better defined for the Kinect. There's another one of these sections like this, but I'll let Amo Chow explain this one. Take it away! Yeah! Oh, and I should also explain the best way to jump. The best way to jump? Yes, the best way to jump. When you're jumping from a board, I'd actually recommend that you crouch lean as opposed to straight up squatting. The problem with crouching in a squatting based manner is that this game moves too quickly for you to crouch in such a way that's comfortable. That's why I recommend this slight lean, as you won't break your knees this way. There is one potential problem in that the game might think that you are leaning in the respective direction you are facing, which would only be a problem in the case of trying to aim for certain upper platforms. Personally, I've never had much of an issue with this considering that the effect is very slight, 
and that all jumps throughout all three entries are always straightforward in their trajectory, no matter how much you are heading to the left or right direction when you approach these ramps. Though jumping to side paths would be a great idea for future entry. Jumping with the bike gear can feel a little weird in that it doesn't always feel like you are getting a satisfying charge when you're holding down the bike gear's jumping gesture. While you're in the bike gear stance, you jump by lowering your arms to press down, and then raise your hands in the air like you just don't care, and you're off! What's weird about jumping with the bike gear in this game is that even if you aren't fully charged with your jumps, you can still easily get constant X ranks with your tricks because the game counts you raising your arms high into the air as an extra input for high ranking tricks. Funny part about this is that you are pressing down and ejecting straight up into the air, which feels so natural for anyone to do that you'll be getting, well, constant X ranks as a result of this system. Getting x rank tricks on boards, however, is a lot harder, to the point that most of the tricks on boards that I've performed in this game were s rank tricks, as you might have noticed by now. I've tried several times at the beginning, but never found a means of having it be consistent throughout my playthrough. I guess if all else fails, I'd just recommend flailing your arms to the side for the best of luck. What? Don't look at me like that! On a separate note, I'm glad they were able to make the X icons look like actual X's this time, as opposed to what looks like a sideways H from the previous entries. I also appreciate the return of the hot pink letters being used as the best grade of something, though instead of a mission it is the X trick icon itself. Oh, and before I forget, I would beware the mission where you have to jump from rail to rail. Your knees will cry out in agony from the constant leaps into the air. The best way I'd recommend playing these missions is that since it's impossible to fall off the rail while grinding, I would actually recommend that you face your TV directly and get down Panther style to prepare yourself for the next jump. It will take a few tries, but once you get used to the delay you should be fine for the most part. Also, the best way to swim in Dolphin Resort Standard edition is by doing that swimming motion that one guy was doing in the trailers. And that the best way to get rid of the fog in Magma Rift is by holding your hands as high as possible and waving them around. All things considered, I can appreciate that there aren't too many precision based elements in Sonic Freeriders. The most precise the game ever gets in its design is when you're sliding to dash rings to take off in flight from a jump ramp to the side. This is because you don't have the same level of precision as before, so you're forced to compensate for this. Or else you'll miss your chance. And that's with just trying to lean into the jump ramp to automatically leap. Trying to actually jump manually while aiming for the ring is harder, though gives you more airtime to work with at least. That being actual jumping, not sliding. It also might just be my preference, or that the game is better this way, but turning and leaning in the direction that you are facing feels more natural than turning and leaning in the direction you are facing opposite against. However, even in spite of the game compensating for this new control scheme in its level design, let me remind you all again of the game changing the sensitivity every time a new race starts. It is because of this why not many even bother with Freeriders, even if it's just to make fun of it. It's why so many reviews and talk about this game are so short, consisting of most reviews just saying, Poor controls, don't buy it. Or another way of putting it being... Though in spite of all that I've said about the controls, they aren't the worst thing that I've ever dealt with. Truth be told, I'm more upset with the lack of content the game has here. It would seem that others were praising the amount of content this game has, but apparently they either think the previous entries have tons of content, or that they just haven't played those entries ever before. Either way, the amount of content is not impressive for this game. I understand that the writers games were more or less, again, as I keep repeating myself, budget games compared to the other entries in the Sonic franchise, to the main course of their respective years, 
But this is where budget and priority have become the most apparent. For starters, being on more capable hardware with more disk space than previous entries meant a lot more could have been done with this game. But instead, the game's scope, at best, is as expansive as the previous entries. That is to say, not that expansive. When it came to the previous entries, the only other things to do for single player after story mode was mission mode, when in of itself can get pretty easy, and unlocking all of the extreme gear. The replay value for those games are not the best. In fact, some of the worst for the franchise outside of the Chow Garden of the Adventure games. Boy, I sure do love when a game's idea of replay value is doing the same easy thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over and... Ah, oh, you get the point! Alongside completing mission mode and story mode, to get 100% in these games you have to collect all of the extreme gear. Now, shopping for extreme gear doesn't sound like a bad idea until you realize that the gear is super expensive and the amount of money you earn is very little. It's these shops I have an issue with. These shops, my friends, are one of the problems of the whole picture. Now, getting rings isn't too hard in these games, but even if you play these entries with the mindset of 100%ing them as fast as possible via collecting everything, you'll still take quite a while to get them all. The fastest means of achieving this goal being completing the World Grand Prix mode while using gear specifically made to increase the amount of rings you collect. I suggest World Grand Prix mode as opposed to Free Race because you get an extra 500 rings per completion first place. However, even doing that will still be long and boring. Zero Gravity seems to make up for this a bit, with the lack of time-sensitive hidden characters, by having more gear! Yet dialed back to compensate for this discrepancy with more expensive gear as well! Free Riders fortunately doesn't pad itself out as long as the previous entries, but also has the least amount to buy out of the three entries. Or at least having the cheapest wares anyway. Truth be told, I shouldn't even be saying that purchasing new extreme gear is a bad thing in this case. Well, it is bad for how much unnecessary padding it adds to these games, but hear me out here. It's a problem, because for the longest time that I've been playing the Riders games, I've been playing against computer AI that would only be difficult for those who have never played a Riders game or racing game before and are ignorant of what to do. Look at this! Do these demos even look extreme? The intensity of this is comparable to a carousel or merry-go-round. I've seen others criticize the first game in particular for its lack of a proper tutorial. Not to mention that the tutorial video for some bizarre reason is hidden away in the options instead of, say, the first time someone starts story mode? I'm just saying! There is also the manual, but no one ever mentions the game manuals in general unless they are making a video about them. Adding on to that is that many consider the tutorializations of video games should be in the games themselves, not in their supplementary manuals. I can see why many gamers would have this mindset, but denying the manuals' incorporation is like still denying a part of the game that the game does right. And that doesn't feel entirely fair. That's just me. I mean, yeah, it would be better if it was in the game itself, but denying it would be... Well... Again, denying... Something that the game does... Or... Something related to the game that it does right. So, that's just my two cents, anyway. Anyway, while I can understand where they are coming from, this was hardly my biggest concern when I first played the game. Sure, I didn't know everything. Sure, I struggled a little. Sure, I didn't bother to look in the instructions manual. Oops. Sure, I wasn't aware of that tutorial video that was placed in an awkward spot. However, that still didn't prevent me from improving and getting better at the game. That is primarily because of one thing that all three games have in common. That again, being the AI. Once you become good enough at these games, you'll find yourselves halfway across the courses before you even realize that you're way ahead of them. 
To put it another way, spending a gargantuan amount of time buying stuff wouldn't be so bad unless the games were more engaging. Remember, I said that these shops are one of the problems of the whole picture. I never said that they were the big problem in of themselves. I said that they were a problem to a bigger picture. Eh <laughs> eh? Waka waka! <laughs>